Good morning. morning. Welcome to service here at Salem. For those of you who are watching online, welcome. Tell me if you're out there, welcome. Uh, Really nice to have all of you here on this holiday weekend. Um, We do. Please, Margaret is going to. Hi, everybody. Good morning. So there will be coffee hour. I'm really planning on doing better this week. (laughs) I think I know how the coffee machine works now. And then I also wanted to say that for the fair on September 24th, there will be a sign up sheet at coffee hour. Um, For those of you who have spoken to me, uh, I think most of you, your names are down unless you said I'll help, but we didn't get a chance to discuss how. So please do come sign up. And if you haven't already, we very, very much need volunteers. And if you're watching online, please call me. Um, I'm just gonna say my phone number like this. So 248-759-7500. Um, and you can always call the church. That's fine too. We really, really do need volunteers and it's going to be wonderful. And uh, yeah, thank you. Say one more thing. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> oh. Whatever you want. Yes. Okay. <laughs> one more thing. And that is back to you. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, downtown Farmington has a uh, kind of like a party on uh, Halloween that goes from four to six. So uh, I'm going to suggest to the board that we might put a table out in front with candy on it so that we can join. Something else to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so here, call the worship. God said, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. We come in the name of the Spirit, resting from our labors. Let us worship God this day. Please rise in body and spirit as we sing the church. Thank you. 
work of God, whose hands built the earth, molded our bodies, and sold the stars across the sky. We gather in your presence this morning with praise and thanksgiving for your mighty deeds. Meet us here, work of God. Strengthen our hearts and our hands to work with you in the building of a world filled with justice and peace. Amen. We all sin and fall short of God's glory. And since our sins are forgiven in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please take a moment to greet each other, um, but distance. <laughs> In thanksgiving for God's grace, we all sing. It's the simple things in life that confuse me the most. <laughs> uh, okay, so we are uh, talking about a message for the children. Uh, they'll do the message. Uh, but you know, I was thinking this morning uh, on the way over, uh, Kathy, how old uh, is uh, Tim? Six. Six. I, I was just thinking, and the way I was thinking, you know, I, I remember when I used to carry Timmy around, he was just a baby, and now he's six, so time kind of doesn't fly. So we're talking about a, a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. Now, what I wanted to ask the kids is, do they know what a prophet is? Do you know what a prophet is? Sometimes we take this kind of stuff for granted. So, hey, it's a prophet, but what if, well, a prophet is a person that God talks to, gives a message to, to give to the people. So Jeremiah was a prophet. Uh, he lived around the time of the exile when Jerusalem fell. When Jerusalem fell. Yes, thank you. I've been preaching in Selene, and I and I and I and I say this kind of stuff when I say. Yes, and the people give me this blank stare. <laughs> Either they think I'm nuts, or, but uh, and so during this exile, uh, he lived kind of right before it and during the exile, and he's the one that was trying to get the people back to God. The people had always fallen away and came coming back to God. And so God tells Jeremiah, to go to the house of the pot. Now, I brought this for the kids. Uh, uh, this is a pot, of course. Um, this is actually a pot that my dad made. My dad was a pot. So, uh, 
And then after a while, he just plain smoked pot. No, no. But he was, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And you know, and this is way off track, but you know what's funny about that is because it's legal, there's 10 marijuana shops on every corner. So there's no, there's no profit in marijuana anymore. I mean, it's so common that, anyway, that's way to say <laughs> Not that I know a lot about this. <laughs> so, um, so God tells Jeremiah to come to the house of the potter. So Jeremiah comes to the house of the potter and God speaks to him. And the point of the potter is that um, if you know about pottery and you make any pottery and see people, you know that oftentimes you sit at a wheel, the wheel goes around, you throw the clay on and you work the clay as you build the sides of it up. Well, once in a while, as you're doing that, something will go wrong. The pot will spin out. It will, it will become locked. You might get done with it truthfully and think, geez, this is really ugly. So you smash the clay together, you throw it down on the rock, you throw it down to get the air bubbles out, and you start again. So what God is saying to Jeremiah is, I can do what the potter does. I can do what the potter does. In other words, I can change the hearts of the people. I can do what the potter does. So Jeremiah was a prophet. He predicted that uh, the fall of uh, Jerusalem uh, and unfortunately people didn't listen to him but the point of this is that a God like the potter can change people. So that's the children's sermon. I have uh, I have chunks of Plato. <laughs> and then I was thinking about it, I thought, you know, Ruthie and Timmy, they're too old for stuff like this. You know, I mean, it's kind of <laughs> So, okay, so now we have the next, the uh, reading of, I thought for some reason we had him, the reading of the scriptures. Thank you, Carol. Our first lesson is from Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 11. After the Assyrian Empire destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, the surviving remnant of God's chosen people clustered around the city of Jerusalem in Judah. To this sometimes unfaithful community, the prophet Jeremiah spoke. In today's text, he likens the people to an imperfect vessel forming on the potter's wheel. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working on his wheel. The vessel was making of clay, was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel that seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation, concerning which I have spoken, turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, 
I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. Our second lesson is from Solomon 1 through verses of this brief letter from Paul to a Christian slaveholder. Not trying to abolish slavery, Paul urges a new attitude between masters and servants. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to our beloved co-worker Philemon, to our sister Ephesia, to our fellow soldier Arch Archippus, and to the church of your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I mention you in my prayers, because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the partnership of your faith may become effective as you comprehend all the good that we share in Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though, I am more than bold enough in Christ to command you to do the right thing. Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love, and I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might minister to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this so that you might have him back for the long term, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he was wronged you, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Here ends the lesson. from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter. Now large crowds were traveling with him and he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, 
Yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I got it. Thanks. <laughs> that button is so small. So we start with Jeremiah. I'm not sure why, but Jeremiah is one of my absolute favorite prophets. He predicts that there will be a fall of Jerusalem. Now understand that Israel, what they call Israel itself is to the north, but Judah is to the south, and Jerusalem is in Judah. So Jeremiah lives in Judah and preaches in, in uh, Jerusalem. Now what's really tricky is that Things were relatively good in Jerusalem. The economy was pretty strong. People were pretty happy, and there were a lot of false prophets that were telling people, it's okay. You don't have to listen to this guy. It's okay. You don't have to repent. Everything's fine. God's not going to do anything. Don't worry about it. Just keep living. And Jeremiah continually says, wait a minute. We need to repent. We need to turn back to God. And so he says, God says to Jeremiah, go to the house of Potter and I will give you a message. And the message that I didn't really want to tell the kids is that if I say that a country or a nation is one that I'm going to help build, and they turn to do evil, I will destroy it. But if a nation does evil and then repents and turns around, I won't destroy it. You see, what we have here is the God of the Old Testament. Do you, do, you, do you notice the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Do you recognize the difference of God of the Old Testament? This is God! Do what I say! Or else! If I was going to convert somebody to Christianity, I would not start with the Old Testament. I wouldn't. People would be up all night, scared to death. <laughs> Is it that the truth? Yeah, it is, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we have this dramatic switch to the New Testament. Where God loves us so much that he sends his only son to be with us, to save us, to help us. What a switch. So if I'm going to try to convert somebody, I'm certainly going to start with the New Testament. 
And then when they're already converted and it's too late to turn back, then I'm going to be able to testify. <laughs> Doesn't it strike you that way? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the point of it, though, I think more than anything else is that, is that God has this ability to recreate, if you will. God has the ability to reach into our hearts and change our hearts. So that's, I think, I, I, you know, and, and then the people do end up in, in, uh, uh, in Babylonia, in exile, and, but Jeremiah uh, gives hope that it will be okay. It will be okay. So Jeremiah kind of covers the whole, the whole, the whole landscape from also reminds the people that there's hope. So that's really important. Uh, Paul and Onesimus. This is a very short letter. Uh, Onesimus is a slave. He comes to Paul. Uh, he meets Paul somehow. We don't know how. Somehow he runs into Paul. Interesting since Paul's in prison. So I'm not real sure of how that happened. Unless he had one too many and ended up in prison for the night. I don't know. But, uh, but somehow he meets Paul. And Paul converts this slave. Converts it. Christianity. Now, one of the things that we really have to understand here is that slavery at the time of Christ in the first century was much different than slavery like we think of it in the last 400 years when, in the United States and in the southern islands and whatnot. Uh, at this point in time, slaves could they could have very high positions. Uh, so, it, 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 you know, I, the, certainly the Egyptian slave masters were cruel, but, but, but at this time in first century Palestine, it was very possible that a slave could, uh, could be respected and could have a high position. So he's, he's an apostle. He has the ability to say to Philemon, I want to keep this slave period, see you later, have a good day. But he doesn't want to do that. He wants to have Philemon give up, um, give up the slave of his own free will. And he says, in effect, you owe me your life. And I, my interpretation of that is, you owe me your life because I'm the one that converted you. I'm the one that converted you to Christianity. I'm the one that taught you. So, uh, so he says, whatever This is what's really critical about this passage. When he talks about Onesimus and taking Onesimus back, he talks about Onesimus as being not a slave, but a brother in Christ. A brother in Christ. Paul has a great regard for Onesimus. He has a great respect for Onesimus. And so he says, please take him back, but do not treat him as a slave. Treat him as a brother in Christ. Can you imagine how different slavery would have been in the United States? had the people treated the slaves as brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ? That's a tremendous statement for Paul to make. Treat him as a brother in Christ. And now we come to what I consider the real meat of the New Testament. We come to this quick passage from Luke. And Jesus is talking about what it takes to be a disciple. What does it take to be a disciple? Now, we got to back up a couple of weeks. Uh, last week and uh, the week before, or the week before that, we talked about Jesus. Um, healing on the Sabbath, remember this? 
And uh, the first time he healed on the Sabbath, it was a lady who had been sick for 18 years. She was bent over. She had a demon. He Officers in the synagogue got real upset. How dare you to, how dare you to heal on a Sabbath? And then last week it was the man that had the swollen arms and swollen legs. He was at dinner or at the, uh, uh, a meal with the, one of the lead Pharisees. And Jesus asked, is it in our law, the Jewish law of Moses, is it legal to heal on the Sabbath or is it not? He's already just had a big hassle over healing this lady. And so we asked them, is it legal or is it not? And they can't answer because they're afraid to get trapped. They're afraid to get trapped. So he heals the man. So I'm going to suggest the idea that Jesus is very much frustrated, if you will, by frustrated by the attitude of the Jewish people. He has come to save the Jewish people. He has come to save them. He has come to bring them back to the relationship with God. That's the whole purpose of coming. Bring them back into the relationship with God and everything he does and everything he says, they question, they argue with, they turn away from him. He's frustrated. And so he says, what does it take to be a disciple? What does it take? And he says, certainly, if you were going to build a building, you would look at all of the supplies that it takes, all the labor that it would take, and you would make sure that you had the resources, the dollars, to complete the building. Otherwise, people would think you a fool. What does it take? And then he says something that's I think fantastically difficult to understand. Remember, Jesus speaks in two different terms. He speaks in the spiritual term, right? A lot of what he says is spiritual. And then he speaks in the material, the concrete term. So he says, you must pick up and carry your cross. What does that mean? You must pick up and carry your cross. Okay, I gotta go get a tree and I gotta make a cross. I gotta carry this 300 pound thing around. I'm carrying my cross, Lord. I'm carrying my cross. No. No. But if you don't tune in to Jesus, if you don't understand Jesus, if you are not one of his sheep, so as to speak, if you cannot hear the spiritual part, if you cannot understand the spiritual part, then that's what you see. Got to carry this thing. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about having to deal with the sadness, the persecution, and even death. See, I'm going to, su I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus already knows what's going to happen. He's heading towards Jerusalem eventually for the final time. Where do, you, where do you murder people? Where do you execute people that are prophets in Jerusalem? That's just where it happened. He knows that he's heading to Jerusalem. So he's trying to prepare these people. He's trying to say, if you're going to follow me, you have to be ready. You have to understand what it means to follow me. It isn't just walk with me. Today we're feeding you 5,000 people. No. No. It's about living with the sorrow. Living with the persecution and the possibility of death. And he makes a statement about the family. Remember the passage where he says, I have not come 
bring you peace. I have come to cause division. Remember this passage? Yeah, Pastor. Oh, no. He says, I have come to cause division. Fathers will go against sons, daughters will go against mothers. Everyone will go against mothers in laws. <laughs> I think that was my part, sorry. Uh -oh. But the the point being that there will be those who will choose to follow Jesus and those who will not choose to follow Jesus. So you might have a father who follows and a son that doesn't, or a daughter that follows and a mother that doesn't. And that will split families. So he's not saying, gee, I want to split families. He said the result of this will be that there will be some families that will be split up because some will believe and some won't. And scholars will tell us that because of this, that's one of the big things that led to the uh, poverty uh, in, the, in the first century. That families were broken up and people had to learn to depend upon the community, faith community that they were. So he's talking about families. And he's talking about mothers and fathers. And he says, you must love me more than you love your children. More than you love your spouse. You must love me above everything else. But isn't that what we say anyway? Don't we always say that? Who's first in our life? God. Isn't God first in our life? I'm getting some looks out there. <laughs> You're scaring me. So God is first in our life. That's what Jesus is saying. You, I must be first in your life above anything else in order for you to be a follower, in order for you to be a disciple. Man, those are some tough terms. I want to tell you, those are some tough terms. You gotta pick up your cross. You gotta be prepared for the sorrow. You gotta be prepared to possibly lose some friends. You gotta be prepared that, that there's gonna be people that won't even talk to you. Not so much true in our world here, but you go to the Middle East, and let me tell you, this is true today. When I was in Sterling Heights as a pastor in the Lutheran Church, uh, we had a lot of refugees that were from the Middle East. They gave up everything because of the Christianity, to stay in a Muslim uh, Islamic culture and be a Christian, you're dead. I mean, there's just no, there's no, uh, we don't necessarily have that here. We have freedom of religion, including, by the way, freedom of religion means the freedom not to believe, right? Everybody puts these signs on the law, freedom of religion, freedom of religion thinking that you're going to be a Christian. No, if it's freedom of religion, you have a right to say no. <clears throat> so I met a lot of refugees that came over here. Uh, a lot of them were Chaldean Christians because of the threat to their lives that they stayed in the Middle East. So it's a lot to ask. It's a lot to process. We take it for granted that we're disciples. We grew up in faith. Of course we follow Jesus. Since we were little, we've heard that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible does. We've grown up with it. This means that for these people that were just beginning to understand this new way, that we're just beginning to understand this person, Jesus. It was a lot to ask. And he says, you must give up everything and give it away. I interpret that judgment. 
I interpret that not so much as you must give it all away, but rather you must make sure that your heart is with God. That you do not have a worldly, worldly expectation. That you do not worship money. That you don't worship things. I still want my Porsche. But <laughs> that you don't that you don't worship worldly things. That your heart is with God. And that you use your resources. So it was a lot to ask. And if we look at it, we still have the responsibility to carry our cross. We still have the responsibility to follow God. We still have the responsibility to follow the example of Jesus. Fortunately for us, God is a very forgiving God. We stumble, we fall, God picks us back up. We sin, we ask for forgiveness of Jesus. And we become righteous once again in the eyes of God. What a tremendous God we have. It just amazes me every time I think. Amen. Amen. So we have some special music, House of the Lord.
This is my first time to meet you and to hear you. You have a most beautiful voice. Thank you. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Father, we have so much to pray for in this world. There is so much craziness. Yesterday, a guy stole the plane and tried to crash it into a Walmart. We ask you to help us to understand. We ask you to give us patience. And in this brand new school, There be no violence in schools. We ask for a world in which our students, our young kids, don't have to be afraid to walk down the halls of their own school. We ask you to be with those in the Ukraine. We ask you to be with those in the bordering countries that are trying to accept refugees and help people to stay alive. We know that we have a world that's scary, where there are floods, where there are tornadoes, where there are earthquakes. But we know, Lord, that through this, you are in charge. <clears throat> we ask for help for all of those who are sick, those who are sick. You are the great healer and the great comforter, although we do know that sometimes your way of healing is not the way that we want. That sometimes your way of healing is more of welcoming them to a new chapter in their life, to a new world in heaven. We ask you to be with all who have died. I ask you to be with family of our friend Chris, who suddenly died on Monday. We ask you to be with all of the families that are in grief. We know that it takes a long time to grieve and to heal. So we ask you to be with families that are grieving. And we ask you, Father, to be with each and every one of us. We've just talked about how difficult it is to be a disciple. We ask that you would give us strength and courage and help in our efforts to be disciples, in our efforts to walk on your pathway on a day-by-day -day basis. We would ask for your help. And now we take a minute to pray in silence to ask God for our own prayers and our own concerns. Father, we give you thanks for the blessing of Pastor Lawrence and ask that you would be with him and keep him safe on his vacation. And now please join me as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now please let us 
present with joy our offerings of commitment and support and for doing the work of God. Let us prepare Christ's table with the offerings of our life. Now let us prepare the table. Eat bread and body and spirit and join us and hear our hearts once a week.
This is the man Christ is in. This is the man. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now please join me as we repeat our mission. Let us go forth. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God, creator of the universe, bless your labor as well as your rest. May Jesus Christ, Mary's baby and adopted son of a carpenter, bless the work of your hands and heart. May the Holy Spirit, ever connecting and expanding with us, bless your life and service to God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise in body and spirit, if able, and join the Christ there is in East or West, 439 in the middle. Please remember that there is coffee out. Mm -hmm.